questions. Okay. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Yes. And thanks for inviting me. Uh, yes. And thanks for all, all of you coming, coming here today. Um, this is a great opportunity. Um, we owe a great uh, uh, debt of gratitude to not only your community TV station, they interviewed us today too, and now this, it's, it's great. We don't see that happening. We all want to see democracy function and uh, it's forums like this that give people a, a true understanding of what, you know, the, uh, uh, what democracy is all about. But a little bit about myself, um, uh, I, I've uh, been working and living in Vilas County now for 12 of the last 13 years. And uh, I came down in 06 to take a job at the local radio station selling ads. Um, and uh, as far as uh, my education goes, I have an undergraduate degree from Ohio University. And I have a master's degree in industrial labor relations from the University of Oregon. And uh, my main focus there was economics. And so uh, you'll see if any. Well, there's still some more leaflets in the back uh, about my positions on, uh, about my campaign, so if y'all get a chance, you know, be sure to grab one. But, um, Excuse me, can you speak up a little bit? There okay. are some people who are hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, uh, yeah, um, so anyway, is this better? Okay. Yeah. 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 I can help you out. I always juggle the microphones when I have one, so it's kind of good that, that we have good acoustics in here. Um, but... Yeah, I, I just want you to know too that uh, this this time around um, we're at a very uh, critical time I think in our district's uh, history, um, and I'm going to refer a lot. Well, you want me to go into any issues or? No, I will ask you a question. Oh, you want to ask questions? Yeah, so they're all number, so. Um Well, maybe there's a question about my background. Anything that anybody has in mind that they want to know? Uh, I hate talking about myself, but. Uh, must be the Lutheran in me, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to stick to a pretty strict question schedule, and the intermission is going to kind of be like an open so you guys can talk to people if they have any questions during intermission, so I'm going to talk to you. Um, but we're going to lead off with our first question, um, and so this is, our previous CD7 representative, Mr. Sean Duffy, was not very responsive nor accessible to many of his constituents. He chose to listen mostly to constituents who were campaign donors or who towed the Republican Party line and ideology. During the 2017 and 18, when the current administration was trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, Mr. Duffy did not bother to respond or show up at town halls he was invited to in, his di in this district unless they were scheduled by his office and then only the elite invitees were allowed to attend. He held very few town halls at all, in fact, and was essentially absent from this district's constituents. If you are elected, will you vow to be available and listen to all of the CD7 constituents, regardless of party or persuasion? And if so, how will you plan to fulfill this vow? Okay. Well, the best example of that, and certainly Sean Duffy and Tom Tiffany and the rest of the Republican Party leadership, uh, you know, especially during that, I, I assume you all remember the mining bill of 2014. That was a very uh, uh, onerous action. They were imposing uh, mining onto a tourist economy. We're a multi-billion dollar tourist economy, but yet at that time, the Republican leadership, including Duffy, including Tiffany, and every other leader that's still in there now from that era, uh, which is only five years ago, all refused to meet with their constituents over something that is so important as uh, that mining uh, bill. And uh, so they went ahead and shoved it down our throats. They said, this is going to be the way it is. And if you don't like it, that's tough. Because why? We don't have home rule. And so they have the right to not, you know, to go ahead and, and like in this instance, and Tom Tiffany spearheaded this. So, uh, you know, as much as anything, this is a, this election could be and should be uh, a referendum on the leadership of the Republican Party. And they simply have done everything they can to please their big mining interests, benefactors. They're big, what, a, big oil benefactors. All the, anybody, big dairy benefactors. Look what they're, they're doing to the, to the dairy industry in this. We have a $43 billion dairy industry. But no, they won't meet with the people. In fact, the board that they have, like in, it's called the Livestock Siding Board, I believe is the name of it. That's who uh, these big concentrated animal farm uh, operators go to. 
They don't want to go to the people and talk about what they plan to bring in. And this is what happened during the mining bill too. So we see, we're seeing a pattern by this uh, so-called leadership in how they deal with communities. And it's, uh, it's it, they are not. They're just saying it's our way or the highway. And yet they keep getting reelected. And I think it's time now uh, that, well, for me, of course, I'm going to be there for any community that has an issue, especially a dangerous issue like like uh, like these concentrated animal feeding operations. They're actually moving in, or trying to move in, to Saratoga, right here in Wood County. I have a meeting with uh, one of the uh, uh, news release outfits. They're, uh, they're, they're part of the community television. They want to interview me. And I, I met with some of the people from Saratoga. And uh, no, they, they, it's, they're imposing this, even though they know that Golden Sands, which is the name of the, uh, I'll just call them CAFOs, okay, instead of trying to verbalize, concentrated animal uh, feeding operations is the long term, but CAFOs is the short term. So we don't want to see those kinds of things. And, and even though uh, uh, there is no home rule, the, the people of the city of Saratoga, Saratoga tried to stop it by using the permitting, of the building permit uh, route. And they, they dragged that out for five years in the courts, and they finally got a ruling from the Republican-dominated Supreme Court of Wisconsin that a CAFO, even though it has a history of, of offenses, environmental offenses, health hazard offenses, manure spreading offenses, that farm that they're proposing for Saratoga has uh, projected that, to be as large as 5,300 head of cows. That produces enough manure that's equivalent to what uh, Madison produces on a daily basis, but of course Madison has a you know a way to process it. With what these capos do is they just put it in a big lagoon, and uh, then you know that's that's where all the methane comes from. And it's, you know once they spread that raw manure over the porous soils of, that we have in our farmlands here in Wisconsin, it uh, leaches into the water table. Um, this is all history of this particular capo that the Supreme Court of Wisconsin just said could go ahead and move in. I mean, they, their building permit was in order after it took them five years to figure that out, I guess. But the people of Saratoga are just, you know, they just wanted to delay it. They, they wanted to somehow to shoo them off, you know, get out of here. But we don't have home rule. But again, the Republican Party leadership has set it up so that these things can move in next door to any one of them. They can be your neighbors like that. They're not stopping them. So, yes, you have to meet with the people on issues like this. This is a uh, John Hopkins uh, Center for Public Health uh, also warned, this is back in 2011, that we risk having these animals being so concentrated. Uh, we, and in fact, we see in, in, in the swine industry, in, in the hog industry in China, and in Mexico, where it's higher uh, uh, source of supply for these animals was uh, wiped out due to swine flu. Has anybody heard of swine flu? It's transferable to humans. What's going to come up with these cattle, all these cows being concentrated like that? They're already a health hazard before the disease that may develop with them transfers over to us. They're health hazards. Uh, the National Health Organization came out in 2011. They did a review of 40 studies about these types of uh, uh, hazards, health hazards, human health hazards. And they came up with the idea, not actually the idea, but the proclamation that there should be a moratorium on it. And yet, the Republican Party leadership is bringing them in. I think we all should be outraged. I think if you're a Republican, you should be outraged. It has cost us 7,000 small family farm dairy operations since 2004. And so it's like they're eating their own. Most of those people probably voted for Trump, I would imagine. But. Uh, they're not only eating their own; they're exposing us to the same hazards that uh, they're, you know, that, that come with that type of industrial development. Right. So the next question is going to be: In reforming health care, how would you restructure one health care delivery, two private and public, so Medicare and Medicaid insurance programs, and the pharmaceutical and medical device companies and their policies and practices? Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a policy wonk, but I do know that I support Medicare for all. And I think we all should. Uh, we, 
we've tried to patch up the current dysfunctional system for years. It's, uh, it's just been a, a, a complete failure. Uh, we have 500,000 people a year declaring bankruptcy because of these uh, the, of medical billings that they've incurred. Just from getting sick, you lose your entire estate. A lot of dairy farmers do, you know, if you get injured on a job, you, that could cost you your farm. It could cause any business person that's marginal, that doesn't, uh, can't afford uh, the high cost of uh, health insurance under the current system. So, um, yeah, we, we need to go to Medicare for All. And I know it, what, it raises the issue, well, how do we fund it? And I know the Sanders plan and, and the Warren plan have come up with the idea of, uh, well, in, in, in the Sanders case, would be taxing the trade done by Wall Street. And I think that's fair. Because right now, if you go downtown in Rice Lake and, and, and deal with any merchant, you buy something, you can't sales tax. But if uh, one of these traders on Wall Street makes a trade and they make, you know, they make a sale, it's like you're they should be paying a, a federal sales tax. And Sanders has come up with the understanding that this would fund this uh, Medicare for All plan, guaranteeing that uh, uh, health care is, is a right and not a privilege. That's what we're looking for. We want everybody to be covered uh, because we're all Americans and we, we care about each other. And I think that that plan makes a lot of sense and uh, his figures uh, you have to respect because he has enough money to have him vetted by anybody. But uh, like I said, I'm not a policy wonk. I didn't really come up uh, and, and, and go line by line to you know, check out his, his figures, but I feel that that makes sense. And then the Elizabeth Warren plan uh, is, is a wealth tax. And I, well, both of them are, really. But uh, a wealth tax, uh, I saw an interesting statistic uh, a while back, not too long ago. It said that 57% of Republicans support a wealth tax. And it's only fair. Look at 1960. One out of every four Americans had a manufacturing job. We had a, we had a surplus in trade. You know, I mean, we were the ones uh, that were uh, the exporters of goods, the producers of goods. Now you, 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 you go forward to today, one out of 10 Americans works in manufacturing. Well, what were those manufacturing jobs about back, back then? Those jobs were about uh, they, those were union, a lot of them, if not 90% of them, were union jobs. They, they paid a wage, a living wage, that had benefits that uh, allowed a person to send their kids to college. Uh, my brother-in-law worked uh, at Wixom. They made uh, the Lincoln Mercury's down there near Detroit. And uh, he worked in the uh, sewer plant that you know, processed the sewage for, for that community in conjunction with the Ford Motor Company. And uh, he sent all four of his kids to college. And he has a really nice place, you know, for retirement. Beautiful place, way out in the country. Nice home. And that's gone. Used to be, we could be, we could, as blue collar working people, we could look forward to having a middle class style of uh, standard of living. We don't have it anymore. Now it's one out of every 10 is working in manufacturing. And I would venture to guess that 80 to 90% of those are probably non union. So, and I don't think those, can, those employers are looking to make sure everybody has a, a you know, a living wage. So we have to fight for that. Um, so, uh, did I cover that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, do you support universal family care, government programs to ensure all families have access to paid medical and family leave, government-supported child care, and universal long-term care? And elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, Medicare for all includes uh, long-term care and vision and dental, so it's an expansion. I sell health insurance, Medicare supplement plans, that's what I do for a living. And I live paycheck to paycheck like a lot of people do. I'm not afraid to, uh, or embarrassed to, to say so. Uh, we have a, a, a really poor economy, it's not very diversified, and uh, you know, there's few business pro prospects. But I'd rather live here than in the asphalt jungle where maybe you could go and you know, make 80,000 a year uh, in, that, in another market that's more urban. Um, the other thing uh, we're talking about here is uh, universal uh, pre-K. That would run about $75 billion a year, uh, the last figure I saw on it. Um, and it gets into the question, well, how do we fund these programs? I mean, yes, they're important. And I do support having, having uh, child care, uh, uh, free child care for everybody, free universal pre-K. 
And we also want to go a step further. We want to see free public college for, for our kids and, and, and for, uh, or, or if they prefer to go to trade school. Well, how are we going to finance it? Goes right back to that 1960 figure I just mentioned. One out of every four back then had the uh, uh, good job where they could attain middle class uh, standards of living. But now we don't. So um, the, the one thing that we have to understand is that who made the money transitioning from one out of every four in manufacturing to where we're at today with only 14% of our economy involved in manufacturing at all. And so many of us having to work two and three jobs just to, just to get by monthly. So it wasn't that they transferred all, that, uh, all those factories to Mexico and China and didn't make any money doing it. In fact, I would venture to say that a lot of these companies are making money today from something they did 30 years ago that hurt the blue collar uh, prospects of being middle class. So if anybody comes back to you when you say that, yes, we need to have universal pre-K and we need to have universal child care, you can say to them is, look, this is, they have the money to do it. Uh, the Elizabeth Warren plan calls for, what, a 2% tax, wealth tax on everybody who makes $50 million or more. Well, that's what, is that going to lower any, any rich person's standard of living by paying that? I don't think so. So um, this is the way to fund it. Under FDR, it was a 91% tax. That's how we got out of the Great Depression of the 1930s. And I like to refer to myself as an FDR Democrat. I really think that FDR, you know, he's the one in his administration created the uh, New Deal. He also created, uh, through his administration, a lot of things we take for granted today. Social Security, anybody getting Social Security payments or will soon? That's an FDR program. What about uh, Work Progress Administration, putting people to work at good paying jobs that have no employment? Do we have infrastructure problems in this country today? Well, people in, in cities can't, can't even drink their water without worrying about it uh, because it's so tainted. That's a big job. We have bridges. Do we want to see any more of those Minneapolis bridge collapses? That's what we're facing if we don't come up with the infrastructure repairs that are necessary. What about organizing? We had the Taylor Act back. That was another FDR minister. The Taylor Act gave us what? The right to organize. It gave us the middle class with the blue collar people in it. It made us one of the biggest markets in the world that's desired by all the countries. They all want a piece of this market. And we built it. Through FDR's administration, we set the tone. Now a lot of that's disappearing. We want to see people making $15 an hour. And, you know, I was talking to the uh, editor over at the Lakeland Times in Monaco the other day, and he said, well, look, uh, you know, uh, this might put a lot of small businesses out of business if they had to pay their workers $15 an hour. But, you know, if you can't afford to pay a living wage, maybe you shouldn't be hiring people, number one. And, and number two is that uh, anybody who works and then has to go down to the welfare office and, and, and apply for food stamps and housing assistance is, is being given a, the worst indignity you can do to a working person. Nobody wants a handout. But what that effectively is, we are subsidizing the employer that won't pay a living wage. I was in Hardy's in uh, Wausau talked to one of the manager there. She's on food stamps, and yet she, she, she's making 11 an hour. But uh, we're subsidizing Hardee's, a multi-billion dollar fast food company. They're using the welfare system to subsidize wages that they refuse to pay. That's wrong, and that's on American. And I just think that uh, we need to continue uh, putting pressure on to make sure that uh, $15 an hour is, is the base. I mean, if you look back at the minimum wage in 1970, workers were being paid more then than they are today at today's minimum wage, even though it's higher. Because of the cost of living. They, they didn't put a COLA in there. And that, by the way, $15 an hour should include a COLA, cost of living adjustment. We need to do that. Um, and these, I know 
it sounds like you know fantasy land here. We're talking about things that may not happen, but we, this is our only option. We we don't have the option anymore of just sitting back. All of you need to be active. You know, uh, get on the phones, uh, get people out to vote, let people know that uh, when the election is, let them know that uh, you'll give them a ride. We just need to, and also get this message out, especially on this. I think the CAFO issue. I wasn't even aware of it in December. That's how new it is to me. If I can talk about it, I know all of you can. Because it's such an uh, important base issue. Uh, we cannot allow 7,000 family farm, highly capitalized family farm businesses just to be swept away because some Republican Party leadership want to have these big dairy, big ag interests uh, as their benefactors so that they can run the next election. You know, this is wrong. And uh, did I catch everything there for you? Yeah. Okay. All right. And you kind of touched base on this one. And the answer, but do you support returning to the progressive taxation model of the last century oh, where millionaires and billionaires are taxed at 70% oh. or more? And then he laughed. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, it's, uh, it was 91%. And you know what? We had a booming economy when, when in the 50s and 60s, in the in the late 40s, with the 91 percent tax, and uh, uh, that paid for the interstate roads, uh, paid for a lot of things since since uh, the day of uh, FDR, and that legacy still lingers. Um, but yeah, that would, I would, of course, uh, that's necessary, and I think the Elizabeth Warren plan and the Sanders plan, talking about the wealth tax, too. Two cents on every dollar over 50 million. I think that makes a lot of sense. And if we need three percent, it's still a lot cheaper than what they were paying, you know, uh, back in the 50s. So they have to pay for it. They have run the working class in this country down to bare minimum standards. Having to have two or three jobs in order to make a living is unfair. It's inhuman. Um, <coughs> making us compete. Uh, for the slave wages that they pay in China and Mexico, threatening to throw our folks out of work because uh, they can get it done cheaper, that's wrong. And I think our international trade agreements have to include this fact, that if we're going to trade with a totalitarian country like China and, and a country that's almost a narco state like Mexico, you know, they have to show us that they deserve to be entered into the American economy, to trade with you know, to actually sell stuff here. And we need benchmarks that show that they have made progress on their human rights, that they are allowing their workers to uh, collectively bargain, or, or that they're uh, imposing conditions like uh, environmental uh, regulations that allow them to outcompete us because they don't have to, uh, you know, they don't have the same standards we, we have here. So we need a level playing field. That's been something that organized labor has, has argued for forever. And uh, you know, we all these uh, trade deals and things just haven't worked because there seems to be like there's just no uh, standards. You just come in and do what you want, sell your products here. That's fine. And I don't think we should offer any autocrat that op that option, any tyrannical government that option. Treat them like they're just one of the rest of. Uh, of uh, Western Europe and, and, and the countries that do have democracies. It's not right, and I and, uh, think we can do better. Okay. All right, Zoraida Schick, here's a little bit. Do you support the Green New Deal? And also, if you were elected to Congress, what would you do to fight climate justice, okay. fight for climate justice? Yeah. Well, one of the, before I got into this CAFO issue, my number one platform plank was uh, a Green New Deal for the um, seventh congressional district, and the reason uh, for that, obviously, is to fight climate change, to find environmentally friendly <coughs> industries that would dovetail nicely with our with our uh, environmentally friendly tourist economy. <coughs> so, I uh, propose, and this is based on a study I did personally years ago um, about meat products, because I was uh, I had a gig job selling meat products, and you know you get curious about what you're dealing with and why are you paying this amount of money uh, for this amount of uh, value-added meat products, that's where it's all shelf-ready and ready to sell. Um, why is the cost uh, this way and why has it happened to be shipped all the way from 
from northern Illinois, which is where I was getting my product then, all the way up here. Um, and we raised some of the best meat animals in the world. The red and black Angus cattle, they come from all over the Midwest to buy our cattle up here. But the farmers only get the live weight price. That's all they get. They don't get any of the you know, steaks, cuts, or any, any of that. They, that's what they call the value added. So uh, I delved into that, and I collaborated with the North Dakota State University Aggie Congress. I happened to find one of his uh, feasibility studies on, <coughs> on, on, on the website. And uh, he walked me through it. And, I, uh, and piece by piece, I put together a feasibility study and getting all the cost factors lined up. And come to find out, after he reviewed it, he says, this looks good to me. But it showed that we could have made, with this study being operational, a quarter of a million dollars of new money coming in to the Northwoods. And so what does this involve? The study involved the uh, building of, of a slaughter plant, meat processing, and direct marketing cooperative. And again, we're looking to be environmentally friendly, so we felt that using these as anchors in a com community and having about six or seven of them spread across the seventh district, we would attract small family farms in. But what would be the attract? I mean, what? How would? How would? How could we show that this is going to be commercially viable? Well, what the study showed is that we could sell our meat products, beef, chicken, and pork, or poultry and pork, were the only three that I looked into carefully because those are three high demand products. So, getting back to the question, that's what I would want to have done if I'm elected to Congress. We need to have, to, I tried to do it myself before. This is years ago, but the thing is, there's just too many hoops. We have to get the feasibility study done. Then we have to get uh, the financing done. And we have to find out what the uh, Small Business Administration's role can be. Then we have to find out what monies we can get from what foundations. Have to coordinate all this just to get one plant in place. And of course, before that all starts, we have to have the feasibility study done that could cost twenty or $30,000, which is covered by USDA Rural Development Grants. So putting this together is a job. You need a congressman that can work with the people in the community. And getting back to your earlier question, yes, uh, this whole thing is focused on being involved with your local county commissioners to uh, maybe do a consortium of counties to get one of these facilities built. And I think it would go a long ways towards bringing new family farms into the community and uh, also be environmentally uh, uh, sustainable and dovetail nicely with our, with our multi-billion dollar tourist economy. The other prong of that was because I don't, I don't know if you've all been over to uh, uh, Marathon County or, or, or Lincoln lately, uh, Park Falls, that's in what? That's in uh, Price County. But we've had, uh, we've had a lot of problems over there with, with unemployment. For example, Park Falls just laid off within the last three months 300 employees uh, uh, at their mill. Brokaw has been shut down for a while, but I think they, they employed maybe several hundred employees there. But that's all gone now. That's not operational. I did a lot of work uh, getting petitions signed for getting on the ballot in Rhinelander, talking to the people there. From what I gather, they're operating at about 30% for that mill. It used to employ close to 2,000 people. So what do we do as, uh, some, for something that's going to put people to work, allow the farmers to uh, and new farm businesses to come in and the current farmers be able to have some more cash flow? Um, so what I'm proposing is to do the same thing as with the slaughter plant meat processing and direct marketing. Set up a cooperative venture uh, where, where possible in order to get uh, 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 a consortium of county commissioners to do a, have a feasibility study done to determine if hemp would be able to give us a commercially viable and sustainable product. If we were to find something like that, it would help, you know, of course, put a lot more farmers to work. And one of the things that interested me most uh, was a, uh, a report I, I, I read in the paper about Germany and their automobile manufacturing. They now do all their interior automobile molding made from hemp. So 
That, that sounds very promising. I don't know how many different products are out there. That's why these uh, key feasibility studies are so important to do. We have to move forward because the Republican leadership is not showing us that path. And uh, I, I believe what we need to do is make this election, as much as anything else, a referendum on the Republican Party leadership and, the, and, and do we, we need to ask our friends who are, who are Republicans. Do you really want us to stay on this path? And I don't think any of you would agree that that's right. Especially when you point out to them that we've lost those 7,000 highly capitalized small family dairy farms due to these CAFOs. So I think we have a big issue, a great issue to put out there. And we want Republicans to vote Democrat this time. We want them to send a message that these CAFOs and this policy of destroying the environment, bringing health hazards into our community, not sitting down and talking with us first, just having that arbitrary ability, this has to be stopped. And the way to send that message is to have your Republican friends and your independent friends vote Democrat. Vote for Lawrence Dale on February the 18th. I think that would send a loud message. All right, and this will be... Um more questions, but these are pretty quick ones. What is your top priority if you were elected? Well, your number one. Boy, you know, there's a, so many important issues, but what has grabbed me, as you all can tell, is this, this concentrated animal feeding operation industry. This is out of control. This is a health hazard. It's a dangerous. It's a danger to our communities, and it's throwing thousands of uh, <coughs> independent small businesses out of business. Uh, we are totally decimating the iconic industry of this state, with, which is dairy farming. They uh, also need to understand what dairy farming, the way it's done by small farmers, is environmentally sustainable. These CAFOs, on the other hand, with their open lagoons, are emitting methane, leaving the carbon footprint that your small family farm would never leave. So if you want to use agriculture, to fight climate change, then we need to uh, transition. And, and well, I'm calling for a moratorium on my campaign. Let's have a moratorium on these CAFOs. These things are <coughs> simply too destructive. And I think there's a lot of evidence. And those of you who have my flyer with my website, I have some more on the back there if you could uh, pass them around. Um, what, what you will find there is a link to the um, uh, investigative report done by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. It's very detailed, but if you follow it, if you read it carefully, I think you'll come to the conclusion that I have come to. And I think there's collusion between big agribusiness and the leadership of the Republican Party. And I'm just extrapolating that from reading this, this very uh, in-depth report. So you all can read it yourselves and see if I'm uh, right about this. It just, uh, it just seems crazy that you're having all these farmers leave the business because of the overproduction of milk, which is driving the price of milk down so much that it can't cover costs. So you see multi-generational family farms having to go out of business when in fact they produce a great product. So why is it then that under the uh, Walker administration, and a lot of those people are still here, why is it that they uh, did the initiative called Grow Wisconsin Dairy, giving incentives to farmers to increase the production of milk. That's what's driving them out of business already. It's just madness. And they just are so haughty. They think they can do anything now. And we have to talk to our Republican friends and tell them this cannot go on, that we're against all these family farms being shut down, and we're against this collusion that's going on simply for the Republican money, uh, Republican Party to get the money from these wealthy agribusiness operations. So, um, did I cover? Yeah, and this will be a last, a really quick one. Um, what would be a good catchphrase for people to remember you by? Good catchphrase. <laughs> um, well, the, my first plank uh, in, in, on my website is, uh, you know, we need to have a moratorium on CAFOs. If, if that is something that uh, will help you remember uh, the campaign heart, 
We need to turn this district. I mean, it's almost imperative. If you all haven't got the fire on you now, with this kind of uh, onslaught against our neighbors and against the, the, the environmental uh, integrity of the neighborhood you live in, this, like I said, they can they can locate these things anywhere they want. And uh, if you want to get in touch with the or see what's going on with the, the CAFO down there in Saratoga, they they, they have a uh, their web page is uh, <coughs> protectwoodcounty.org. Protectwoodcounty.org. They have a really nice slideshow shows you the pictures of the things that they're fighting against. <coughs> these, things, these very same things could be in your neighborhood, you know, within the next couple of years. So we have to get the home rule back, and uh, that would be a, a, a very important thing. But I guess the main thing is I don't think even Republicans uh, respect the fact that. Uh, uh, the path that the Republican leadership has taken us on is is one that uh, is is one that's viable. It's it's destructive, and I think we have to uh, fight hard to get rid of it. But I think it's to our advantage because I don't I don't know if anybody Republican or Democrat is going to say you know uh, eh, it's just business as usual. It's the market forces that are going to you know it's not market forces. So anyway, anything else? No, that is it. Um, so we are going to go into about a 15 minute intermission. I don't think Trisha's here yet, is she? Unless I am not looking around. Should be pretty quick. Okay, so. I think so, a five minute intermission will love to it. Okay, good. So there is um, refreshments for that. Thank you to everybody that brought them. Uh, so go ahead and get that settled and then we'll continue. If you have any questions for Lauren, I think a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for coming, folks. Uh, I'll turn it over back to you. All right, All right so we're going to have Trisha come to the stage. Um, and she's going to do it, so like we do with Lauren, she's going to introduce herself, give her your story and stuff, and then we'll go into the questions. So, everybody here. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for prioritizing tonight, um, prioritizing this election. Um, and coming out, uh, I know everybody's time is valuable, so I appreciate that you're here tonight. Um, I'm Trisha Zucker. I'm a Democratic candidate for the 7th Congressional District Special Election. And what an amazing opportunity we have here. Not only are we going to flip this district, but when we do, Wisconsin is blue again. And then, given Wisconsin centrality in the presidential election, we can reclaim our country from this Trumpian nightmare. Um, <laughs> the, pathway, the pathway to uh, a new president is Wisconsin special election, Wisconsin 7th special election. So this is so critical. There's already national attention about this. I don't know if you saw the story in The Hill. Last week there was something in Daily Kos. Um, but people are paying attention and come April, this special election is going to have national attention. And we really need to elect a strong candidate that is going to beat the Republican. And we all know who he likely is and all the dark money he is funneling in. So I was born and raised in Wausau. I am Ho-Chunk on my dad's side, and I come from generations of dairy farmers on my mom's side. My grandpa was a dairy farmer in the town of Easton just outside of Wausau. I grew up in a strong union household. My mom is a United Steelworkers Local 2-224 union member for 30 plus years, including serving as reporting secretary for over a decade. And I was out on the picket lines when James River was striking in 1992. Some of you might remember that news coverage. It was over two weeks of strikes. I was 12 years old at the time. I am a first generation college graduate. I attended University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I earned a triple major and certificate in four years. And I did that through hard work, I did that through scholarships, some help from my tribe, Ho-Chunk Nation, and working two jobs because I had to put myself through school. My parents didn't have the funds. You know, they had me young. They tried the best that they could. But, you know, growing up um, didn't have a whole lot. In fact, when I was seven years old, there was a snowstorm, much like the one that's going to be coming through here in a couple of days. And my mom couldn't get her car out of the driveway to work. We couldn't go one day without her wages. So what she did was wrap herself in a blanket and walk the four miles to work. And that is 
what shapes how I see the world and how I see doing things. Looking out for the little guy because I am a little guy. Gal. Um, so I said, I'm a first generation college graduate. After that, I went to law school at UCLA. And I chose UCLA because of their stellar federal Indian law and tribal legal development program. And I'm so blessed that they chose me too when they accepted me. Um, and I went out there and I studied in that program and I earned my law degree and I, and I passed the California bar exam and I practiced law for a bit out there. And then I brought that education and experience back to Wisconsin. And I did that because a really exciting opportunity arose and it was a special election. And that was a special election in the Ho-Chunk Nation for the position of Associate Justice on the Ho-Chunk Supreme Court. And I was the underdog. There were four candidates. I was by far the underdog. Uh, but I campaigned really hard because that's what I do. And I, when I put myself out there for something, I do it 120%. So I was campaigning. I, I was living out in California, coming back to Wisconsin to campaign. And some of you might know that Ho-Chunk Nation is the only tribe in Wisconsin that doesn't have reservation land. So of the 11 federally recognized tribes, my tribe is the only one without reservation land. Our lands are held in, in pockets throughout the state called federal trust land. So you can imagine what that's like, having to fly back to campaign in Nakusa and Wittenberg, and then go back to California, and then come back and campaign in Baraboo and Toma, and then go back with my two and a half year old in tow. I'm a single mom, by the way. Um, and he, he's, he's been on many campaign trails by this point, by the way. Um, but I'll tell you, it was really good foreshadowing, campaigning all throughout the state, because this congressional district is huge. 26 counties, one third of the state. I have been all over it. I have been meeting with so many voters. Everybody is desperate for change, desperate for real representation. I am too, and that's why I'm running. Well, I did prevail in that first election in 2013. I did prevail, and I moved back to Wisconsin with my son. And uh, we were first living in Indian Heights, down in Wisconsin Dells. That's some of our tribal trust land down in Wisconsin Dells. And then um, I moved back to Wassa. My grandpa, the dairy farmer that I told you about, he was in his last years. And I said, I'm going to take my son home, uh, be close to grandpa. I'm never going to regret that. And it's true because he was called home last year, and I say Grandpa brought us home. And when he, in doing so, there were other things that I ended up doing in the Wassa community. Uh, a situation arose when my son was in kindergarten. He's in third grade now, but he was in kindergarten in the Wassa School District. And I was reading about the child poverty, and I was reading about the skyrocketing food insecurity that is suffered by our children in the Wassa community. And I was so alarmed, I went to local <coughs> organizations so I could learn more, because that's what I do. I dive into something, I find out the numbers, I find out the data, I think that we have way too many decisions that don't go to the data, that don't listen to the scientists, that don't listen to the experts, and we need to be doing that. So I went to United Way of Marathon County. I uh, met with people from the Marathon County Hunger Coalition, and I learned about the sad situation of our students that have the free and reduced lunch at school. So they know that they have Friday lunch, right, at school. But they don't know where their next meal is going to come from until Monday morning at breakfast again at school. And so I went to my local school board, Wassa School Board, and I said, we need to do better. We need to do more for our students. Hungry students can't learn. And at the same time, there was a last minute town hall that my congressperson was holding. And I just so happened to find out about it. I don't know how because I wasn't on a list of friendlies. But um, I, I managed to find out and I went over there and I couldn't believe it, but he called on me. So I asked him about this. You all know who I'm talking about, right? He recently resigned, leaving us in this situation where a person has to run twice in one year. Um, and anyway, I, I asked him about this and I said, I told him the numbers. I said, this is heartbreaking, we need to do better. And this is the response I was met with. Yeah, it's really sad, isn't it? Are you kidding me? That's 
your answer. You are somebody in a position to do something. I was so angry, but also motivated. Have you ever felt that way where you, you're, you're angry, but you use it, you channel it to motivation? I said, I'm going to run against this guy. And I called the seventh CD chair, and I spoke with her. At the time, it was Melissa Schrader. Now it's Kim Butler. But I spoke with Melissa. And I found out about a number of candidates. And I, said, and I found out about Sean's uh, $2 million already amassed. And I thought, OK, maybe now is not my time. And so I focused my efforts more locally. And I, ran, I ended up running for uh, Wausau School Board because I went there and I was vocal about change. And I said, well, I can be vocal about change or I can be in the seat and be a decision maker. And so I campaigned really hard once again and I unseated an incumbent. And I should tell you, when, uh, with the Ho-Chunk uh, campaigning, the tribal elders say I set a new standard of campaigning. <laughs> and they say that in Wasit too about the school board election because most people don't knock on 3,500 doors or have signs all over town. But I did because I wanted to do it. And I felt I could do it. And now a year later, I'm the school board president. <laughs> yes. I mean business, okay? <laughs> um, so Wasit School District is the 13th uh, largest school district in the state of Wisconsin. And while I've been on there, I have um, done a number of things. Maybe some of you have, have heard of those statewide efforts as it relates to um, educational policy and retirement of race-based mascots. Um, that's going to be voted on by all public school boards later this month. That is something that started when I brought that to my board, and then I sought co-sponsorship from 18 school districts. And since I did that work starting just last July, three of the 31 school districts that still retain those mascots actually undertook to change. And either they did it right away, or they're doing it at the end of this academic year. And that is profound because thousands mm -hmm. of students will now not be exposed to a hostile learning environment. And um, it's just really an important matter of educational policy. I've also worked on things in the Wausau area and in Maritown County, not in an elected capacity. So just, just to point out, I serve in two elected capacities, one for Ho-Chunk Nation, my tribe, one for Wausau. But I also worked on uh, getting Indigenous peoples they recognized in Wassa. I went to the Wassa Mayor and Wassa City Council, got a proclamation to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, and then I worked with the Marathon County Board. And that is the largest county board in this country. 38 people serve on it. And I have had a resolution, way too many people. I mean, how efficient is that? <laughs> Hopefully they'll address that at some point. But um, 38 people, it passed unanimously, a resolution to recognize the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day. And that is really important because when you live in a community and feel invisible, um, that, that, is, that is important. And in fact, I then formed a nonprofit and fundraised for, uh, to bring back a powwow. And so just this past October, we had the inaugural Central Wisconsin Indigenous People's Day powwow. And that wasn't just for the Native community, although it was important. It was for everybody. Everybody was invited. Everybody could come, enjoy our music, uh, see our beautiful uh, regalia, eat our food. It was just an experience for the whole community. And that powwow was October 12th and 13th. I announced my run on October 14th. I can't tell you what that week before was like, but it was, in, it was, I couldn't because I don't have the words. It was so hectic between announcing the run for this and um, getting that power off the ground and running, and it was a success. We had 200 dancers on the floor, 12 drums, and for anybody that knows about powwows, that's a really, really great powwow. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope it's coming back next year, but I have to delegate uh, quite a bit next year. So, um, a couple of things that I just want to say, and then we can talk about why I'm running. Um, and that's something people want to know. They say, well, why are you running? Why are you running? Well, it, it's not that this is the first. It's not like I just thought this was a good idea. You know, I, after the debacle of the exchange in 2018, I decided probably, you know, down the road. I was thinking 2022. But this opportunity arose, and it is an opportunity. It is our opportunity to take back this district. Because once somebody is in that seat, it's pretty hard to get them out. So we gotta get that person in that seat in May. Well, only two people have served in this seat in the last 50 years. And it's important to me, um, I, I believe in public service. I have a demonstrated record of serving my communities, uh, of 
putting the time in, putting the effort in, and doing the hard work. And there's three things about me when it, when it comes to decision making. But the way that I look at everything is through the lens of compassion, making sure this is the compassionate choice, making sure that we're looking out for our vulnerable, our most vulnerable. Second lens of equality. It doesn't matter what somebody looks like or who they love or how they love or how they identify their gender. Everybody is equal and we need to make sure that our legislation reflects that. And third, opportunity. How are we providing the most equitable opportunity so that people have the best chance at success? And so that's how I approach things. Um, I think it's important to remember, too, that we need to achieve a government that actually reflects society. And our Congress does not reflect society. When I'm elected to this seat, I will be the first woman ever to represent Wisconsin 7. It is 2020. Women's issues are human issues, and people shouldn't vote for me because I'm a woman. People should vote for me because I'm a woman who's going to get the job done. Also, Wisconsin has never been represented by a Native American. I will be the first Native American, specifically Ho-Chunk, to represent Wisconsin in Congress. And third, I didn't even know this until after I was already running, um, when I'm elected to this seat, I will double the population of single parents in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> does, that, does that sound reflective of society? No. I'll tell you why, because the system is rigged. We need campaign finance reform like there's no tomorrow. And quite frankly, if we don't address some things, there might not be tomorrow. Look at this climate emergency yeah. we're living in. We need to do better for our planet, for our children, for our grandchildren. But no, we seriously, we need campaign finance reform because it is keeping out people that would be excellent representatives. You know, I don't accept corporate PAC money, so I'm getting my $10 donations and $20 donations out. I appreciate each and every one of those because I know the value of a hard-earned dollar. But my likely opponent is sitting there with those dark money just funneling in. We need to get corporate money out of politics, and it's the people that vote for their representatives and only the people. So um, those are a few things I can address specifically concerns that I, I have on my mind. If I have the time, I know you have questions for me, but just kind of like my, my issues, or do you want to? Let's do my questions and then okay. your issues at the end. Okay. Um, and actually, this is an attendee question that kind of goes into some part of your story. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with this one. Our previous representative, Sean Duffy, was not very responsive nor accessible to many of his constituents. <laughs> And he chose to listen mostly to the constituents who were campaign donors or who told the Republican Party line. During the 2017 and 18 um, repeal of the Affordable Care Act, Mr. Duffy did not bother to respond or to show up at town halls he was invited to in the district unless they were scheduled by his office and only the elite invitees were allowed to attend or he didn't publicize it to any of the public. If you were elected, Will you vow to be available and listen to all of your CD7 constituents, regardless of party or persuasion, and how do you plan to fulfill this vow? Absolutely. Okay, first of all, when I'm elected to represent Wisconsin 7, I represent everybody, not just the people that voted for me. And that, you know, people need to get that as a starting point. Um, I will have regular town halls with ample notice to everybody, um, not this secret list of friendlies, I know because I wasn't on it, um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, but uh, I think that um, absolutely that we need to ensure that there are town halls, that people are heard, and that I can listen. You know, it's not just about me talking. I need to hear. I just came from an, an event um, in, in Barron, not an event, but a meeting with some, some uh, members of the Somali community, and it was primarily to listen so that I could just hear their concerns. Uh, and that's so much that's an important part of leadership. Um, I have another uh, experience with our former congressperson that, that is similar and uh, is along these lines. So in June 2018, some horrifying practices were occurring, separating children from their family at the border. Something that I think is 
inhumane and needs to stop immediately. And so I and hundreds of other lawyer moms, call ourselves, formed a group called Lawyer Moms of America. And we drafted a letter um, to our respective congresspersons that would be delivered. So it's, it's a single letter, but then we <coughs> identified who would be the person to deliver that letter to their congressperson. Any guess who delivered to Sean Duffy's office? <laughs> yeah, it was me. Um, so I delivered that. And of course, I mean, he wasn't there. It was the WASA office. About six weeks later, I received a letter in the mail that didn't address at all what my concern was. And you know, it's insulting. It's insulting, and I think we should not insult one another. We should treat each other with respect, even if, it, even if the viewpoints are differing and there is disagreement. I don't know how there could be such disagreement on such an inhumane and cruel practice, but I guess that's why he didn't address it. Um, no, but it, it's things like that. You know, uh, I'm 39 years old, so I grew up and Congressman Obi was, was my, my congressman, but I didn't really know about his amazing <coughs> constituency services, but I've heard about him now, and that's what we need to get back to, and that's what the people of the 7th CD deserve. Okay. All right, so the next question is going to be a health care question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in reforming health care, how would you restructure one health care delivery, private, public, so Medicare and Medicaid insurance programs, and pharmaceutical and medical device companies' policies and practices? Okay, so um, health care is a huge issue here in the 7th CD, and there's some differing opinions, but one thing we can all agree on is that if we don't elect a Democrat, and I'm a registered Democrat, and I have been since I was 18 years old, um, if we don't elect a Democrat, the likely opponent is going to do everything he can to destroy health care, to make it more expensive, to make it where more people die because they don't have health care, or go into debt. So that has to be a starting point um, because we have a lot of options on what we're, we're uh, able to address. We need to have accessible, affordable health care. We need to lower the cost of prescription drugs dramatically. I worked in intellectual property law early in my legal career. And it is, frankly, intolerable that we have big pharma getting away with charging us here in America 10 times what they charge that same drug in another country. It's wrong. And you know why? This goes back to campaign finance reform, because Big Pharma is lining the pockets and buying the elections of those individuals. Again, I don't accept corporate PAC money, and I think we need to take Big Pharma on right away. Um, HR3, you know, this is sitting in Mitch McConnell's <coughs> legislative graveyard. We need to address this. I have a friend who is 71 years old, and she says she can never stop working because her son is diabetic, and he couldn't afford his insulin. He had an accident. It, it's a whole thing. There are six figures in debt. And she says she, she's not going to leave. He's an adult now. She says she's not going to leave him by the wayside. It's her son. So she says she can never stop working. And she actually was excited. You know, uh, some, some of the promises that were made in the last presidential election, thinking it was going to help them. But it didn't, right? Yeah, right? Um, so that's something. But uh, going to health care, though, um, we, I've been going all around this, this district, and everybody recognizes how gerrymandered this district is, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we win this district. And we are going to win this district by allowing people some choice. I support Medicare for all for those who want it. And certainly if it gets to a vote on the floor, I will vote in favor of it. But we are not there yet. We are hearing so much about this because of the presidential nominees, the Democratic presidential nominees. Mm -hmm. I have been out talking to folks that they like their health insurance. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to feel that something is imposed on them before they've had an opportunity to <coughs> um, learn more about it. And I've been talking to union members who negotiated really hard for their health care. Mm -hmm. And they don't want that to be taken away from them, which is how it feels. We have to remember how things feel to somebody. So, if I'm going around saying that we need to do this right away, 
that doesn't allow somebody to feel empowered in making their own health decisions. And that's what we need to do. People need to be empowered for those personal decisions. I say that whether I'm talking about my fierce defense of a woman's right to bodily autonomy, or similarly, their right to make their health care decisions. Now, going back to your town halls and your question about um, having these meaningful conversations with constituents, should that legislation come to, to the floor for a vote? Well, that gives me time to hold those town halls with ample notice and hear from individuals and for me to explain why I'm voting a certain way. But to run out here now, we're just not there. I think we need to look at the big picture right now and remember that if my likely opponent wins this seat, more people will die and more people will go bankrupt. And we can't let that happen. Perfect. Awesome. Oh, and P.S., when we're talking about, this is not even a P.S., but you're moving on. When I'm talking about uh, health care, keep in mind, I'm also talking about mental health care. We need, to, we need to make sure that we are covering mental health care and that people are getting the help, the assistance, and the medications that they need. Awesome. All right. And do you support universal family care, government programs that ensure all families have access to paid medical and family leave, government-supported child care, and universal long-term care, U.S. free? Yes, I support these programs. Um, I think that we need to look at how we're supporting them. Uh, we need to tax the people that need to be taxed. We need to tax our corporations. We need to tax our millionaires and billionaires that aren't being taxed at the rates that they should be. And when we do that, we're going to be able to provide these opportunities for success for our children and for our families. Okay. okay. And then the next question is going to be, which kind of goes into this, do you support returning to the progressive taxation model of the last century where millionaires and billionaires are taxed at 70% or more? Well, as I said, I believe that we absolutely have to address the taxation system and tax millionaires, billionaires, and corporations like they should be. I cannot commit to a percentage um, that we're, we're not where we need to be. I can't say 70%. But we absolutely have to increase the tax that taxes that they are paying. Perfect. Okay. And our next question could be: Do you support the Green New Deal, and what will you do to fight for climate justice? This is this is so important because we are dealing with a climate emergency. You know, people are talking about climate change, but we're dealing with a climate emergency that needs to be addressed with the urgency it requires. Um, we need to ensure that we have clean air and clean water and that our beautiful land stay protected from corporate greed. Um, I definitely support serious efforts, meaningful efforts, and I think these are things that can be incorporated in legislation across the, across the board. You know, what's the environmental aspect? How can we include something that is going to help this planet, that's going to protect the environment. Um, I think that the Green New Deal is, is excellent principles, and, but it's not legislative text. And we need to have an opportunity for debate. It's, it's resolution, but we need to have something that can be debated. Um, but I, I agree with, with the principles, absolutely. Perfect. And then what is going to be your top priority if you are elected, your first thing you're going to do? Oh. Yes. Um, well, I think that we, we have to address prescription drugs. We have to um, lower the cost of those. It's just, what Big Pharma is getting away with is just criminal, quite frankly. Um, but, you know, you're asking me about something, and it's like I, want, I really want to be able to talk about the farm prices, too, <laughs> and the fact that we need affordable, accessible health care. It's hard to say just one. Because we have so much at stake here. You know, I know it's my name on the ballot, but really what we're talking about is the farm crisis, is health care, is lowering the cost of prescription drugs, is the climate emergency, is properly funding our public schools and investing in our children. 
It's good jobs and a living wage. It's campaign finance reform. It's criminal justice reform. There is so much at stake with this election. We need to make sure we get the right person in that seat. Awesome. And then the final question I have is, what is a, if you could choose a catchphrase for people to remember you by during the primary, um, what would that be? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to work. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Hey, that's, and that's how I am. I am all about hard work. One thing that you can know about me is that I am fully prepared to work across the aisle. This is what I do in other elected capacities. In fact, somebody that I work the best with on the school board, he is a politically opposite end of the spectrum. But I do it through respectful communication, through listening, through looking at the numbers and the data, which as I said earlier is something we need to do. Why aren't we listening to the scientists? We need to. Why aren't we listening to the experts? We need to. Um, you know, we look at these rates of gun violence and people looking the other way and uh, climate emergency. So I think that um, the, the work ethic that I have is I want to be effective. It's important to me personally, but it's also important to me because that's what the voters, the constituents deserve. And I don't like this divisiveness. Uh, and I, I, I know it's going to get real ugly. Um, in sooner than later because the other side is going to want to get really ugly and it's important to rise above that. I mean there's times when the gloves come off but I think it's important to rise above that because we are more alike than we are different here in the 7th CD and we just need to look at making life better for everyday Wisconsinites, for our children, for the environment who can't speak for herself and she needs somebody to do it. So um, that's how I approach things. Zunker, let's get to work. <laughs>